First of all, I want to start by saying that I used to be Muslim for 24 years, born and grew up in a Muslim country. Arabic native speaker, I used to go to the mosque, fast, read and memorize Quran. I memorized a lot of Quran chapters, a lot of Hadith, Tafsir Qurtubi, Ibn Kathir, Tabari, and many more. I just had to get this out of the way. For some people that I know that most of Muslim first reply is you don't know the context, you don't know the native language, so I had to explain this. I promise you that in this video I will not lie and if you do not speak Arabic you can go verify everything yourself. I will leave links below. So there is a lot of people that will say, well, how come if what you're saying is true, how come there is a lot of people that understand Arabic and speak Arabic still believe in Islam? Well, first of all, those people have no options. Islam is very clear, commanding people to kill those who leave Islam. There is, this is not even debatable. There is so many Quran verses, there is so many Hadith, there is like like I don't even have time to go through every single one but I will show you a few examples so first of all those people have no options they have to accept Islam as is one what happened is the translation to English because the way to be able for them to be able to get those people that don't speak Arabic the people the European the American and anybody who doesn't speak Arabic the only way to be able to get them to believe in Islam is to provide a translation that's acceptable like what I mean by acceptable because if you translate Quran as is it's like there is no way anybody would believe in that and I'll show you so many examples so for example right here um, this is in uh, a tawbah uh, verse number five yeah. Here, uh, the reason I crossed this, who violated their treaties, because don't even take it from me, go ask anybody who speaks Arabic. Give them this and tell them what it means, and they will tell you exactly that what I'm saying is true. But don't tell them it's from Quran, because as soon as you say that, they will have to lie and tell you, oh yeah, that's what it means, because scholars realize that there is a problem with Quran. With those verses, if they translate them the way they are, nobody would believe in that. What it said here is like, but once the sacred months have passed, kill the polytheists, wherever you find them. The phrase who violated their treaties is added. That phrase doesn't exist. There is no existence to this phrase right here. That this phrase does not exist. This was added by scholars to justify or to try to because they realize that is a problem if they say it as it is. فإذا سلخ الأشهر الحرم فقتل المشركين حيث وجدتموهم حيث وجدتم أقتل المشركين means kill the polytheists. Right after that, حيث وجدتموهم حيث means wherever وجدتموهم you find them. There is nothing else but in between. Nothing and go ask anybody who speaks Arabic. The reason they do this, they do this a lot throughout the whole Quran. That's why a lot of people are deceived and think of Quran as something else it's not. But what we call terrorists, they're actually the ones who understand and practice Quran as is. Those people study Quran 24 seven. They know exactly like what it is. They, they, this is their language, like this is, like I speak this language, this is my native language. So you, you can't just come and tell me, oh no, you misunderstood or, or this or that. So anyway, um, so every single tafsir, every single hadith, explaining it as it is, kill the mushrikeen, wherever you find them. However, I chose the most reliable ones in your view, the ones that are most accepted and the most reliable in Islam. Just to be fair, so you guys don't say, oh, that's a weak hadith, or that's this or that. I chose only the top accepted and believed by Muslims. So, Tafsir here says, then kill the mushrikeen wherever you find them. And I'm going to skip down here where it says, lie and wait for them. And each and every ambush. 
Do not wait until you find them, rather seek and besiege them in their area and forts. I'm going to skip to the bottom. This way they will have no choice but to die or embrace Islam. This video is not going to be about the English translation. I just wanted to clarify first and answer the question in case somebody say, oh, how come there is people that speak Arabic still believe? I wanted to show that scholars realize there is a problem, realize that as soon as they translate Quran as is to English, nobody would believe that this is a book from God. That's why they had to do a modification. They had to change things and add things. Anyway, we'll move on and see other other um, problems with Quran. Uh, this is um, some of the hadith. Feel free to pause the video and look and verify every single one of them. All of these very clear commands to kill anybody who lives Islam. That's why there is a lot of Muslims right now. They do not believe in Islam. They secretly hide in their faith. And they, they just... That there is nothing for them to do because if it's not killing them it's going to be putting them in jail if it's not putting them in jail then they're going to be humiliated and treated really bad by everybody around them before we move on this is another interesting hadith I wanted to share that how Ibn Abbas realized there is a problem with this because um, I, I guess Ali uh, burned some people who left Islam and Ibn Abbas realized that was too harsh to do even though Ali knows more and closer than him to Muhammad and to Islam but anyway um, he was like if it were up to me I would just kill them not burn them anyway um, I'm, I'm, this is enough I think about the, what's gonna happen to people who uh, don't believe in Islam and I'm just gonna move on Next is proofs and evidence from Quran and Hadith that the writer of the Quran thought that the sun is actually smaller than earth to the point where it goes hides inside earth and that it's actually moving versus the earth is going around the sun. The first example we have here is uh, Al-Kahf Surah 18 verse 86. It says, until he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a spring of murky water. I'm going to stop right here. Um, i go back to the second part. But here I chose again the um, Tafsir Ibn Kathir, which is the most reliable and most accepted from Muslims. But you can look all the rest of them. They all translated and explained it the same way. Um, so Ibn Kathir basically said he went to the furthest point on earth in one direction until he found where the sun sets. We'll come to the hadith later as well and Muhammad himself of uh, saying exactly where the sun goes. But for now let me talk about something else. I stopped here because most of Muslim will try to say that oh, what he meant is he found it setting behind the sea. That's what he's talking about. It's false. For one, he, the the words exactly and all the tafsir and all the hadith saying exactly that he found it in a spring full of water made from fire, and he found people next to it. This is the the misleading translation, the English part, because like I said, when they realize there is a problem with the Arabic version, they cannot translate it the way it is. They have to fix it in the English translation or else nobody will believe this. So basically they said near it he found a people. That's incorrect. The actual Arabic saying That means he found next to it people. Near it he found people. So to go back to the point of it's setting near the behind the sea whatever they're trying to say uh, that's incorrect because like I said all the hadith all the translation talking about he found it in a well of, wa of fiery water and my own explanation to this uh, we will come obviously to Muhammad himself saying uh, debunking everything they they trying to say and he actually himself telling us the location where it goes and what it does but um, my theory to this is the writer of the Quran back then he looked and he saw the sun when it sets 
the sky turns a little bit orange fiery orange so he assumed that uh, because he thought at that time the earth is flat the sun is moving not earth is moving he see the sunset the sun uh, the sunrise and then he sees the sunset he assumed automatically that the sun comes from somewhere underneath earth it goes all the way to sunset inside of fiery water uh, spring or whatever that's why the sky turned orange that's that's my own explanation though now let's go see um, what other Quran verse verses saying about this and what uh, the translation and Muhammad himself saying about it so in this one Surah Yasin from 38 to 40 and it says in English and the Sun runs on its fixed course for a term the Arabic says was Shamsu Tajri di Mustaqarun Laha the Mustaqarun Laha means the Sun runs until reach a fixed destination but they tried to change it a little bit to try to uh, make it make more sense but that did not fix the issue because we have tafsir and hadith from Muhammad himself explaining this ayah so I'm going to skip to the bottom feel free to pause it and read it but it says that um, at that point it prostrates and ask for permission to rise so the hadith basically talking about when they asked Muhammad what the what this where the sun goes when it goes to the mustaqarun laha he said that the sun goes rises up in the morning and the evening when it sets up um, it goes to prostrates or kneels underneath God's throne and ask for permission to rise again and it asks again and it will not be given permission but then it asks again and then it will God will tell it yeah go back and rise again so uh, we will see so many um, hadith this is not the only one there is so many uh, tafsir and hadith all saying the same thing that the sun goes kneels and I don't really need to go and explain that the sun does not move the earth actually moves but the writer of the Quran at that time uh, he he was describing everything as they see it from a human view um, basically he thought the Sun when it rises the Sun is small enough to go dips inside a spring of hot fire and then um, where it goes it goes to kneel underneath the throne of God and it begs to go back again and rise again at first God didn't, doesn't give it permission but then he ended up giving it permission so next we will see more hadith explaining to us more about how Muhammad explained this here's the um, hadith where Muhammad telling us exactly where the sun goes referring to that ayah one day in the mosque he told them do you know where the sun goes they replied no only God and his apostle knows and they say it glides till it reaches rest in place under the throne then it falls prostrate and remains there until it has to rise up again and go to the place when you come and it goes back and continues emerging out from its rising place and then glides till it reaches its place of rest and enter the throne and it falls prostrate and remain in that state until it asks to rise up and return to the place where he come uh, so basically when they seen the Sun going down like I said uh, in, a, in a spring of fiery water um, and then this ayah saying that uh, runs the Sun runs until a pointed place location Muhammad they kept asking him about to answer all those uh, questions about where the Sun goes so finally he told them that the Sun moves and it comes in the morning and then in the evening when it sets up it goes underneath the throne and it prays or um, a kneels in front of God's throne and it doesn't rise up again until God tells her to so it goes back and rise again see there is so many problems with this including the Sun doesn't move earth is moving oh so there is no a sunrise or a sunset that's our 
uh, human language. The sun does not move, does not go and kneel, does not go and worship. The sun is stable, sun is star, sun does not go nowhere near inside a spring of water or anything like that. This Here is another hadith. This one is from Sahih al-Bukhari. Um, this one is actually referencing exactly that verse directly, talking about where the sun goes, where what look what appointed location it goes to, and um, Muhammad told them that uh, it goes um, and pros- prostrates underneath God's throne, and um, that's its fixed location. So I'm going to run through those. Uh, Hadith quick, feel free to pause through them. Here's another one, and this one is actually a, a bigger problem. Because here it says, but a prostration will not be accepted, and it will ask permission to go on its course, but it will not be permitted. So the son having a conversation with God, but God is not giving her permission and telling her to go back. And rise again so the Sun is every day it goes and uh, and uh, kneels a friend of God and then comes back next morning from the other side of the earth and here's another one um, I'm, I'm not gonna keep going through them there is a lot of hadith a lot of tafsir um, this is the last one about this part of the Sun um, we're going to move on I just wanted to give a quick review for up until now we know that the writer of the Quran thought that earth is flat and um, that is sitting on top of poles which we will see that later um, and he thought that the Sun actually moving every morning um, he thought the Sun is as small as he can see it so it comes up in the morning and then in the evening goes and kneels a friend of God asking him permission and he tell it to go back and rise again the next morning. And so it goes underneath earth and then it goes back again up. So, uh, and uh, where, where, where it goes, it goes to inside of spring of fiery water. So um, we're gonna move on now. This is it about the sun. Let's talk in the next slide about uh, all the evidence and proof that the writer of the Quran thought that Earth is not only flat, but sitting on top of a bunch of poles. Was with the Prophet ﷺ once, when the Prophet showed and pointed out the sun while it was setting. So it's Maghrib time, almost. So the Prophet said to Abu Sa'id, Do you know where the sun is headed to? Abu Sayyid said, no, I have no knowledge of that. So the Prophet says that the sun is prostrating at Allah's throne, asking Allah's permission to rise again. And it rises when Allah... And we know that there will come a time when Allah does not give it the permission to rise from the east and it rises from the west and this is one of the ten signs of the day of judgment now one due to our limited knowledge would say come on man what do you mean that the sun sets prostrating at the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal, seeking permission when the sun sets here it rises somewhere else and when it rises somewhere where else, it sets somewhere else. Well, come on, give me a break. I need to give you. When you speak about something that is way above your pay grade. Now, if I ask you, what are the dimensions that govern our world? You would say it's the height, the width, and the length. So these are three dimensions. And recently they've added the dimension of time and the relativity theory of Einstein and uh, how valid it is or not and going forth and, and back. So these are 
the three dimensions, the four dimensions that we can relate to. But this does not apply to the world of the unseen. Things happen in the grave in different dimensions than our own. In this three or two foot by six or whatever, in this hole, we know for sure that the dead person is made to sit and two angels come and interrogate him and either punish him or reward him. We know that this grave is expand. It can be filled with light from Jannah. A window to paradise is open. All this happens in this small area. By which dimensions are we talking about? Definitely not ours. The Prophet on the night journey, alayhi salatu wasalam. The buraq, the ride he took, it travels faster than light. And it's faster, not equivalent. So we can even imagine. It goes and passes by the grave of Musa near the red dome or the red uh, um, dune that is where he's buried and the prophet said I saw him praying there and in a flash they are at Al-Aqsa Masjid in Jerusalem and he the prophet sees him there and he leads him in prayer as he leads the rest of the prophets and messengers of Allah who were summoned there through dimensions we don't understand then in a flash he reaches the fourth heaven and he meets Musa again so what dimensions are we talking about something that does not relate to this world therefore when you hear things of the unseen whether the sun is prostrating to the throne of Allah, to Allah Azza at the throne or not, you do not think of that of your own, by your own intellect, with your own standards, which is height, width, and length. Where are the jinn? Where are the angels? How they travel, how they live, how they exist? This is something that does not fall under our calculations. So we have to always think of how great Allah Azza wa Jal is and devote our forms of worship, our ibadah sincerely only to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and while doing this, we Allah Azza wa knows best. This one, Surah Ar Rad 13, verse number 2 or ayah number 2. Allah raised the heavens without pillars that you can see, not as you can see. The, all the tafsir and hadith expose this corrupt translation. Uh, they tried to make it where as you can see, but it's actually without pillars that you can see. Um, we'll stop here, but let's see what uh, Ibn Kathir says. He says, created seven heavens and earth like thereof without any pillars that you can see meaning there are pillars but you cannot see them according to Ibn Abbas anyway there is many hadith many tafsir like I said I only choose the the most reliable one by Muslims but all of them talk about the same thing that there is pillars underneath heaven that we cannot see um, yeah, we we'll go to the next one. The second part of it is talking about for an appointed term. So basically, الشمس والقمر كل يجري لأجل مسمى. That means, and we will come to the hadith that explains this as well. That means God created the sun and the moon. Each one of them runs until locate. Uh, appointed destination or a fixed destination and none of them supposed to be catching the other this is exactly what the quran says 
Surat Al-Hajj, Ayah 65, it says, Do you not see that Allah has subjected to you whatever is on earth and the ships which runs through the sea by his command? And he restrains the sky from falling upon the earth unless by his permission. So the sky, which is the whole universe with stars, with planets that are bigger than earth, with earth literally is a, like a, 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 a sand, one sand in a whole beach. But God's holding the whole beach to fall on top of that one sand. So let's see here Tafsir Ibn Kathir. He withhold the heavens from falling on earth except by his leave. If he willed, he could give the sky permission to fall on earth. Ibn Kathir saying this. All, all the tafsir, by the way. But Ibn Kathir saying this. And wherever it is would be killed. But by his kindness and mercy and power, he withholds the heaven from falling on earth except by his leave. So um, every day, God's holding the sky and the planets and everything from falling on top of Earth. Um, all right, let's go to the next. Surah Al-Mulk, 65, Ayah number 5. And we have certainly beautified the nearest heaven with stars and have made them what is thrown at the devils and prepared them for them the punishment. So... Like in the Arabic it says Which means God decorated the heavens or skies with planets and stars or with stars and those stars only job or with those stars that God made them as missiles to hit the devil. So God created those stars as a weapon to hit the devil. So We'll come later to Hadith explaining to them to, the, to us why exactly God needed those planets to be uh, weapons to hit the, the devil. But for now, let's see a Tafsir. It says, and we have made them missiles to drive away the Shaden. So oh, this is Ibn Kathir again. All the Tafsir saying the same thing. A Hadith as well. Uh, like I said, we'll go next and see what Muhammad said exactly about those planets hidden the devil and why. Before we go to the Hadith, this is another surah talking about why God needed those stars to hit the devil. So, Surah 15, Aya 16. We have placed within the heavens great stars and have defied it for the observers. And we have protected it from every devil expelled, except one who steal a heron and is purposed by a clear burning flame. So, the tafsir here talking about God created um, those stars and protected the, the sky or the heavens from every devil, except the ones who tried to steal hearing when God talking we will come to this by the way in the next hadith when God talking to the to the angels the devil sometimes or Satan go up and try to steal the hearing try to listen to what God talking about the head to, to angels so God uses those planets or those stars to head the devil to drive him away from trying to steal hearing um, Again, Tafsir ibn Kathir as well, saying um, he made the shooting stars to guard, to guard it against the, the evil devil who tried to listen to information conveyed at the highest heights. Um, again, we will come also as well to hadith from Muhammad himself. Here is one of the hadith. I did not highlight anything in red because the whole hadith need to be highlighted. Um, when God decrees a matter in heaven, the angel move their wings in submission to his word. Anyway, I'm going to skip here. And their heart delivered and received the reply that he said the truth. Then, then those who listen by stealth hear it. 
and they are those, some above others. Sofian said that he puts his fingers on top of each other trying to describe to them how the devil standing on top of each other trying to listen to God's conversation with with angels. Um, this is not, by the way, one hadith only. There is so many. Um, I, I'm just not going to spend the whole time here talking about um, each of these issues. You can go ahead and look um, tafsir and all the hadith related to that ayah and it will show you a list of all hadith from uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, all of them talking about how the devil trying to listen sometimes and steal conversations from God, but then God uses those stars and planets to hit the devil. That's why those plans were made. Now back to the earth being flat. Um, there is so many ayahs, so many verses from the Quran. I'm just going to go pick through and I'm going to go through them real quick. Like I said, there is so many subjects I need to cover. Um, and at the earth, how it is spread out. And Tafsir Jalalain says, And the earth, how it was laid out flat. Those infer from so basically most of the tafsir and most of the scholars um, still to this day believe that Earth is flat and that the whole America and NASA and everybody else is lying and uh, that Earth is actually flat. I know flat earthers will be happy to hear this, but uh, we'll come to so many other examples of Muhammad and the Quran talking about how Earth is flat. Uh, feel free to pause through them. I'm not going to explain everything in every slide of those ayahs because, like I said, there is many other subjects we need to talk about. Here's another one. Uh, Surah 51, ayah 48. Um, like I said, this one has more problems saying it has a high roof protected from falling. Talking about the sky and the heavens. We brought a roof higher without pillars to support it. Anyway, like I said, uh, pause and go look other tefsirs as well. This is another one. This one, um, Surah 13, 41. And that is Surah 2, 22. Uh, both talking again about, and we have made the heaven a roof, safe and well guarded. So I don't need to go again to the example of the one said sand versus the whole beach of sand. Um, so the beach is not the roof for one sand. The one sand is actually very small part of the whole beach. Uh, anyway, I, I, I shouldn't have to explain that. هذا يقول هل الأرض ثابتة أم تتحرك؟ ها ثابتة ولا تتحرك؟ في الحقيقة الذي عليه علماؤنا كالشيخ الإمام عبد العزيز بن باز الشيخ صالح الفوزان حفظه الله تعالى أن الأرض ثابتة لا تتحرك وهذا هو مقتضى النصوص ومقتضى العقل أصلا والأدلة أيضا كثيرة عن الشمس التي تدور الأدلة العقلية بارك الله فيكم لأنكم تقولون أنهم نظريات ومدري كيف حتى نحن عندنا نظريات وعندنا العقول كمسلمين أولا نحن الآن في أين نذهب إلى مطار الشارقة نريد أن نذهب إلى الصين بالطيارة واضح ركزوا معي هذه الأرض إذا قلتم أنها تدور إذا خرجنا من مطار الشارقة برحلة دولية إلى الصين الأرض تدور صح طيب لو وقفت الطائرة في السماء أليست الصين تأتي صح ولا لا تدور تأتي الصين ولا ما تأتي طيب لو كانت الشمس الأرض تدور هكذا لو تمشي الطيارة ما أدري كم تمشي لن تستطيع أن تلحق الصين لأن الصين تدور وأنت تدور ولن تستطيع أن تصل إلى الصين لأنك تدور وهي تدور فكيف تصل إلى الصين ثانيا من الأدلة أيضا قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم من البيت المعمور أين البيت المعمور في السماء السابعة محاذاة إيش قال عليه الصلاة لو سقط سقط على إيش الكعبة أنتم تقولون الأرض تدور طيب لو سقط هذا والأرض تدور ما يسقط على الكعبة 
يسقط في البحر او يسقط في المحيط او يسقط في البر This is a bonus one before we move on to a different subject. This one in uh, Surah 13, Ayah 13, is talking about and he sends thunderbolts and strike whoever he will or they dispute about Allah. So basically God created the thunder to hit whoever he wants with it. And um, in Tafsir al-Jalalain here, he gave us an example that the Prophet has sent someone to invite someone else to Islam and the other person said who is the messenger of God and what is God is he made of gold or silver or copper he was questioning he was asking therefore a thunderbolt came down on him and blew off the top of his head and this is what happened to the disbelievers who dispute or argue or ask questions and Ibn Kathir said explaining this he said this is why um after he explained that those thunderbolts are used for punishment to whoever god wants he said this is why thunderbolts increase as time comes to an end so we're supposed to be if we are at the end of the times we're supposed to be having a lot of more thunder the 99 names of allah in islam this is a big problem in islam that I had so many debates so, with so many Muslims, Imams, so many Shuyukh, none of them was able to give me an answer. And there was only one Imam that was very honest. He told me he needed time to find a, to do a research and find the answer. Ended up calling me and telling me I, I have no answer. Um, I don't want to just make up an answer for you. Um, so. Everybody knows, and this is not not a debatable subject, that Allah is supposed to be eternal. There are so many verses in Quran and Hadith that His name, everything about Him is supposed to be eternal. His names, His word, which is supposed to be the Quran, everything about Him is supposed to be eternal. It doesn't have a beginning. And everything about Him is supposed to be matching Him, describing Him. Like you can't be a loving God, but you're not a loving God. Like if your name is a loving God, you were given that name or you had that name because you're loving. So the question I ask them is, if if God's names are eternal, his, his 99 names are eternal from the beginning, before he created earth, before he created animals, angels, everything, who was he loving? When you say he's the most loving. Who was he hearing? Who was he seeing? How can you give him a name or he has a name that he wasn't being used? When you call him like from the very beginning before creating everything. His name is the loving. Who was he loving? So Islam cannot answer none of this. Um... There is no answer from Islam. I can't answer you from Christianity. I can tell you that the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're loving each other. We're seeing each other, hearing each other, appreciating each other, you know, but Islam cannot answer this. There is, there is no doubt or debate that, um, th that his names should not be eternal like you he cannot be a god and then create his names later or create his word later so there is another problem with uh, with the 99 names of allah the name number 10 and the name number 25 the humiliator and the arrogant what kind of god proud to be called that what kind of God like name himself that and proud to be called that? There is another name in the Quran, which is, um, it's not in the 99, but it's in the Quran. I will, I will I'll put the ayah right here, but um, it's the deceiver, the best of all deceivers. You know what Bible says about the best of all deceivers? It's Satan. I'm just going to leave you with that.
However, when we read this ayah of Quran, we understand why um, one of his names is the deceiver or the best of deceivers. It says in Surah 17, Ayah 16, When we decide to destroy a town, we command the affluent among them, whereupon they commit sin in it, then becomes um, due against them, and therefore we destroy that town. So whenever God wants, and we will come to the tafsir and to the hadith about this, but whenever God wants or desires to destroy a, a, a city or a tribe, he commands the people in it to sin, to do bad stuff. Therefore, he's not guilty for destroying that place. Therefore, they deserve it. Therefore, they earned that punishment that he's going to give them. So, um, Ibn Kathir um, explained everything to us in the tafsir. And he said, Abi, um, Ali bin Abi Tala reported that Ibn Abbas said this means we gave power to the evil people so they committed sin in the town and because they did that Allah destroyed them with the punishment this is similar to the ayah and those we have set up in every town great ones of its wicked people that means God choose some wicked people put in every town some wicked people in case he needs to destroy that town then he used those wicked people. Al Hajj 2273, Al Furqan 253, Al Nahl 1617, Al Mulk 671 and 2 all indicate that God and only God can create. Al Hajj 2266, Al Hajj 22 Al Room 3040, Al Mbiyat 2121, Al Baqarah 228. They all talking about only God can bring the dead to life. Now Surah 5 110 talks about how Jesus created a bird from clay, brought back the dead to life, and healed the blind and the lepers.